Council's uh, meeting for September 22nd. Um, I am just off the uh, off the bullpen bench here, so go easy on me as, as guest chair. Uh, call the meeting to order. Uh, we'll skip approval of the minutes of July 28th, uh, just given the fact that we have a limited uh, board participation tonight, but, and we'll move on to uh, new business, uh, which is to hear the request of Stephen and Ann Misterovich <laughs> for a variance to construct an addition on the front of their home at 10 Beacon Lane, map U15, lot 64. The new construction is proposed to be 17 feet 8 inches from the property line, while the zoning ordinance requires 25 feet. Uh, ben, unless you have comments? The applicants can open up. Good evening, board. Uh, my name is Steve Mustervitz. This is my wife, Ann. We live at 10 Beacon Lane and have lived there since 2000. Uh, we're fortunate to live on Beacon Lane as we have views and partial views of both of the two lights. It's a very popular place for people to walk dogs and drive through. Because of the placement of the house next to us, uh, we're unable to see the working lighthouse. So our dream has always been to have an addition to go out far enough to be able to see that working lighthouse and see the light at night. Um, in doing so, we would encroach on uh, the right of way, which is 25 feet and we would require a variance of seven foot two inches to meet that. I was unaware of a right of way until I had a survey done and found out that it's a 25 foot right of way. One of the odd things to me is that the right of way is 10 feet onto our property. The road is only 10 feet wide and then it's only five feet on the person across the street from me's land. Now, granted, if it was divided even, I would still be a few feet over. But what I'm trying to uh, argue is that we would still be 27 feet, eight inches from the road. And I did a survey of the neighborhood and only one house on the entire street meets all the zoning requirements of lot size and setbacks. Our road in the west part of the road is only 10 feet wide. The east part is 18 foot wide. Two lights, or this area was planned back in 1949, but the houses weren't built until the 80s on the 18 foot part of the road. So that area had a private way so the people on the west side of Beacon Lane are not supposed to be able to cross that part of the road, but the people on the east can come across the west way. For a long time, the road where we live did not even have a name. People adopted Beacon Lane because that's what the other part of the road was. And there actually was a gate, and you could not go all the way through. So the gate would have ended at our property. So to me, by looking at the private way for the east side of Beacon Lane, our road is technically a dead end because I'm not supposed to go any further, and nor is anybody else that lives on the west end of Beacon Lane. There's actually two different road associations for the east part and the west part because the west part, until five or six years ago, was unpaved. So it was recently, recently paved. When I asked the... Uh, a surveyor where our property actually ends and where the right of way who owns that part they said they have no idea there's no record of it there's no record of when the west part of Beacon Lane was opened up so there's a, a lot of mystery so why do I have why am I giving you all this information is because I think the east end of Beacon Lane is the right of way does not apply to them because it's considered a right of way, I mean a private way. The guy who lived in our house, the second owner of the house, 
try to get a right of way for him to travel um, across the east part of Beacon Lane. The developer went to court and got an order saying that he is not allowed to use that part of the road. So I guess I'm saying that our house is going to sit no closer than anybody else on Beacon Lane. In fact, at the end of West Beacon Lane, a house that has side frontage, if you will, the house is actually on two lights road is only 10 to 12 feet from the road. On the other side of that house and that road, they have a carport which is about eight foot from the road and they park their cars right on the grass. So I guess I don't understand why this right of way would prevent us from putting our addition out there. I have to make one omission. Ben called me and uh, asked me if the overhang of the roof is included in our 18 foot. And I assured him that I don't know if that's the way the architect had it planned, but I would not extend it past the 18 foot mark. So I've done a lot of research and reading on private roads and on right-of-ways and see a lot of confusing things that the private road doesn't uh, limit anybody or the public from crossing over. They're just not allowed to park or stop. Um, but yet the people, some of the people on the east part say people are not allowed to go down the road. I, I don't go that way, the east way, just because I know it may irritate some people. Now, we get a lot of traffic during the summer from people who want to see the lighthouse or at the, at the lobster shack. Questions uh, from the board to the applicant? Ben, did you receive any emails or for input? I did not receive any correspondence on the application. Got a question, Mr. Chair. So you're on the west side of yes. Beacon Lane. Okay, sorry, a little confusing. Uh, so how many how many houses are on are, are on the west side? So so you're you're essentially what you might call the end house on the west side. And right. How, how many? But oddly, the house across the street, which all her frontage is on the west side, she is part of the east side of the road. Her driveway is at the big part of the road where it's still 18 foot wide but her frontage is on the 10 foot wide so next to me on the west side is a vacant lot and then there's uh, three more houses including the carport or which is a an official lot it's a 30 by 30 lot it's lot 02 i think it may be the leaching field for the uh, house that has side frontage on Beacon Lane, but is actually addressed as 172 Two Lights Road. Okay. So on that plot, that 30 by 30 plot, the homeowner has like a Quonset hut or a, and they park cars in there. And it's literally eight feet from Beacon Lane. So in, in your chart here, um, I guess in the table, you listed a long list of addresses on Beacon Lane, East and West. Um, is there a figure, is there a column in here for um, this, the, the, where the front of the home is in relation to the property line? Is your set, the setback's going to be from the property line back to I thought I, uh, house. let me see if I have it here. I have front setback to road and then to right of way next to it. Mm -hmm. Because there is a slight curve in the road, so, you know, I I'm doing this with a measuring wheel, so my, you know, measurements, you know, are not perfect. I don't know exactly where the right of way is, you know, if it continues like it is in front of my house. 
you know, 10 feet onto my property. I don't, I assume it carries all the way down Beacon Lane West. I guess what it sounds like is you're looking at what is, looks like a road right now and you're counting, and you're counting the number of feet back from that where you want the addition to be. When really the ordinances are talking about where the exactly. property line is. Right, but that's part of my discussion is if the houses on east are they not subject to the right of way? It, because according to the legal paperwork, they have no right of way. It's a private way. I'm not, a, I'm not supposed to drive that way. So does that mean? I think a, I think a setback is, is typically applied to the, what's called the front, it would be the front property boundary. Right. So whether that's to a right of way or, or it, it must have, well, unless it's, I would think, extremely non-conforming frontage, so it must it must gain access somehow. So it would be whether or not it's a right of way or, or what you might call it, it would apply for a property boundary. Right. But I mean, part of the this chart is to show that so many places are non-conforming. Sure. Okay. Only one house conforms to everything. You know, there's a garage on Beacon Lane that has no house. The house is actually down on Two Lights Terrace. I don't know the side setbacks, but from looking at it, it certainly doesn't look like it, it um, meets side setbacks. It meets the front setback. And then, of course, the two properties I talked about, the uh, garage and the house on Two Lights Road that are on, yeah, on Two Lights Road that are literally 15 feet from the road, or 12 feet from the road. And if you see the summary of how many um, Of the seven properties on Beacon Lane West, four meet the front setback of 25 feet to the right of way. So I'm, I'm not saying why can't I get it because everybody else get, but I guess I kind of am saying if everybody else is allowed to build a garage, have a carport eight feet from the road, I am just want to bring an addition out and still be 27 feet eight inches from the road. So one of the things um, we will consider um, straight out of the ordinance we, we, we need to consider in, in hearing or, or making our decision is um, whether or not you have a feasible alternative and to to extending in, into the front setback. So when I look at when I look at your lot, it's it seems to me um, you could certainly or, or potentially do an addition elsewhere on the lot that right. that would of not course. require I mean, a variance. And the the setback in the back is 300 feet. Sure, but of course that's we want to be further up front. But see, that's the whole. So it's so it, so another so it's, there's not a feasible alternative because if it would give you views of the lighthouse essentially. If I went out on the side, I have there's 50 feet, so I could go out 20 feet at least. However, that just gives me a better view of their garage. So understood. That gets me no closer to seeing the lighthouse. Sure. And that's you know kind of the the, the goal. And we could definitely go out on the other side as well, but that doesn't, that's not what we're... Doesn't accomplish what we're trying to do. Right. Yeah. And if we, you know, the idea is to bring the kitchen and a like bref, breakfast nook out there. Legally, we could go out 10 feet, but that really, you know, we would really want more than that. 
you know, and 15 feet might do it, but then we're, you know, that's going to require a variance as well. So it's, you know, would they okay two foot, or would they okay five foot, or seven foot? So, right. you know, the plan that was drawn by the architect is, you know, the full seven foot two inches. See, I guess I'm looking at the um, at the uh, ordinance, and one of the requirements is that the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. Basically, what you're trying to do is you're trying to make an addition to your home that you're trying to increase the space, um, increase usability, and you're there looks like there are other places to build the addition, either on the back or up. Um, and in this case, the practical difficulty, it sounds like it is a result of an action taken by a prior owner. Obviously, you bought the house as it exists, but at some point, somebody decided to build that house there. Right. So, I don't see but the, uh, the, the house we live in was built in 68, and at that time, there were no houses in fact, the house next to us had a variance for a garage, which makes it 21 feet from our property line. They had to get a, as the neighbor told me, that not everybody signed off of it. And he was worried about buying a house because of, of that. Mm -hmm. And that garage is kind of, that's what we look at on, on, on the side. That was added on 90s, I believe. But it's the location of that house that blocks. If that house was further back, because as it is, our house is the furthest sitting back house on, on the street at 45 feet, 8 inches. What's the, uh, the grade or the slope on the, on the lot? On the front from the road to our house is pretty flat. Okay. There is a drop off at the back of the house, which drops down six, eight feet, and then it continues down. Okay. But the front part of the yard where this addition is just grass, there's no trees, and it is, uh, it is flat. Any other questions from the board for the applicant? Uh, just a couple of questions, Chair. Uh, on the right of way, uh, on I guess it would be the hand drawn version. R O W twenty five feet. That's the right of way. Yes. And it goes from the left side of the drawing to a pin on the right side of your property. Right. Could you explain as to why the right of way does not continue? And do you understand what the purpose of that additional 10 feet is on your side of the street? I, I, that was one of my questions. Why is it 10 feet here? And if my property ends at that pin, that that right of way is not mine, then why do I, is the grass mine? Should I not cut it? Should I leave? I don't understand. You know, that was one of the questions I had for the surveyor, and I had no answer. I stopped the right of way because of those uh, legal things that I read when the previous homeowner tried to get that right of way put in so that he could go east on Beacon Lane. Okay, and so where, other than on this drawing, can you show me the document that talks about the right of way going with your property? I don't have a document. My deed does not say anything about a right of way. Okay, so it was the surveyor that said there is a right of way. Okay. okay. Where? The, I'm trying to trace back the origin of this right of way issue because I, I suspect that we might be discussing it. Where on another document says that there's a purported right of way on the on the papers that have been submitted? The only place I could find was on. 
the document from the developer of the Beacon East property, which is called Wind Whistle Hill. I saw notations on there that there is a right of way. From Two Lights Road to the lighthouse. I don't believe my deed states that. That's why I was surprised when I was given the survey showing a right of way. Okay, so in the packet of material, there are two deeds. Oh, one's a notice and the other one looks like a deed. Which one are we talking about? Those are the deeds or the, uh, from the developer of Wind Whistle Hill yeah. to the former owner of Ten Beacon Lane that he is not allowed to cross Beacon Lane East. What happened is there used to be a flower garden where our road is. So our driveway, you could not even go past because there was a gate and a garden. So this homeowner talked the woman across the street into removing the flowers because he want, his goal was to drive all the way through. The developer, Charles Wright, caught wind of it and served it took seven times, but he served John Hale with paperwork saying he's not allowed to cross over that road. And the paper shows what properties have the right to drive on that part of the road. Okay, so your deed, a copy of your deed is not in these papers, is that right? That is correct. Okay. And I believe my deed does not mention the right of way. Because I believe at the time, the road did not have the name Beacon Lane. It just documents I've found say road leading to lighthouse government reservation from Two Lights Road. It does not say Beacon Lane. And so the only, sorry, in the handwritten drawing. Yes. Is this your? your that is mine, yes. Thank you. And the only reason that you have the dotted line here, that right away 25, you have interpret a comment or some document from a surveyor and you've added that line to this, to this map. Is that correct? Yes, because the survey I received shows that right of way that stops 10 feet before the road. Sure. The, the issue that I have is that that's not before us. So that what you have provided us is a... a it, it, is on, if, it is on their survey that I provided. Is this the, this is the survey that we're talking about? Yeah. If you look at the line, it says 35.8. I may have missed what... I looked at the, the drawing, and I don't see the reference to a right-of-way. On this, unless I've missed it, gentlemen, uh, on the drawing that we're talking about, it looks like the property line uh, is the drawing that we're talking about, where it's 35.8 feet from the edge of your house. And it, I'm just confused uh, as to a representation here in the handwritten one with the right of way and a surveyor's one that doesn't refer to a right-of-way, but indicates the property line is as described. I, I, see it, I see it there, Matt. And it's got a 35 foot 8 inch um, notation just to, down to the left of uh, the 38 feet along the front. And that goes to the dotted line of what he's representing as the right-of-way. Um, and then So that would be at 35 feet 8 inches. But then he's measuring to the, what looks like the road, what looks to be the road, physical road there, or lane, um, is 45 feet 8 inches. So, I apologize, let me just direct it this way. So this is probably not what we should be looking at. Well, uh, and that the property line is, that's kind of our purposes. Big, that's kind of the question here, is I, I look at it as the property line. Yes. Our plan, the surveyor is saying that the house is currently 35 feet 8 inches from, yes. from that. And the plans call for 
it to go however many feet beyond the line of the house now that will then encroach upon the setback. And the question for me is, do we need to be talking even about the, the lane and the right of way itself? Because we should be looking at the property line. I agree. Okay. That issue for me is that this is distracting me as to okay. what the issue is. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. It's the fog of war. <laughs> okay. So what we we're talking about is on this surveyor's map, there's not a reference to a right of way. And the line that we're talking about for our purposes of a variance is the, the dotted line at the base of your property that shows that it's 35.8 feet from the edge of your building. Okay. So I think if we direct no more discussion of the right of way, unless there's other issues, it's, that's what we're looking at. Okay, thank you. I don't have any further questions either. I've got one more question. I'm just curious, where, so I think you, you, you mentioned you were sort of surprised to see the surveyor depicting this, what's depicted as a property line on the right. survey, which you're calling a right of way line, which it very well may be one and the same, but we're, again, that, I, I'm not sure that's um, relevant. Um, where did you believe your property ended? At, at the edge of pavement or at the center line of the road or? Well, that, that's, I, I did not know unclear. and I thought okay. that was going to be resolved in a survey. Okay. I assumed then that when there was a road, private road that it would be in the middle of the road, like a river dividing towns mm -hmm. at the middle of it would divide the two properties, but apparently right. that's not true. Yeah, that, that's not, not typical. I'm not saying that right, it but might not happen somewhere, my, but. Yes, my deed spells nothing out, and I've always, in fact, when we were getting mortgages, they, get, they didn't want to give it to us because they said there's no clear definition where your property ends, who owns this road, who maintains it. Prior to the West putting together a road association to pave it, you know, the road was, you know, eight feet wide and bumps and, sure. and then you got to the end and then it was 18 foot wide paved. Mm -hmm. Understood. So, but you do have, like, the, um, the survey apparently found uh, monuments there. So there's a capped iron rod. There's a capped iron rod on the, yes, uh, on the west corner and another um, iron pipe found, I guess, IPF, um, on the southeastern corner. Right, that one was not there, but they a set one. They set okay. one. The one next to the stone wall was always there. They unburied it. Okay. Yeah, I don't see your your actual deed in here, so I don't have a description of uh, of your lot. So I think what we should be considering then is what is the setback, uh, what's the difference here from a measurement perspective to the property line, not to the road. I think that's the distinction that, that we probably need to answer that question in order to further consider the, to make a decision on the application, which we probably can talk about right here, right now. Um, with a little bit of arithmetic. So, so Ben, have you figured out, have you already have kind of figured out those numbers already? Yeah, he, he accurately depicts yep. the numbers on, on his hand-drawn plan. Okay. He's just, he, he, he's just showing both numbers. Yeah. Okay. He shows his existing house to be 35 feet, 8 inches he's from the property line. He's building 14 40. feet out here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's coming 18 feet out. So he, uh, so he shows both numbers. He shows the distance to the property line and the distance to the traveled surface. So basically, right now, uh, right now he's 35 feet 8 inches from the property line. That's right. Which and, is and that's way, over the 20, way, way over the 25 foot setback. 
The 25 is 25 foot there? Correct. And then he's going, he wants to go in 18, which is going to take him down to 17 feet 8 inches, which is under the 25 feet. That's correct. So without a variance, he could go 10 feet 8 inches. Correct. Or in other words, he's looking for a variance of, uh, I got my math right here, eight feet or seven feet, four inches. Is that right? I think I had seven too, but. It's yeah. what is it? seven, seven point two, Thank you. Is, which, which amounts to about seven feet, three inches. Yeah. Just shy. Any further questions? Anything else that, that you'd like to offer to the board? No. Um, I, I just think with all the irregularities on the street, that what I'm asking for isn't anything that's uh, out of line, in my opinion. Thank you. With everything else, I mean, a house was just rebuilt. I know it's built in the same footprint, but this house is 25 foot from the road. The house is still being built right now. I, I understand that it's using the exact same footprint, but. You know, I just, I just feel like we should be able to uh, do that because I'm thinking about, I realize that the boundary is the end of the land, but I look at the road. I don't understand why the, uh, why these other houses are so much closer, but yet I, I can't do that. I'm still 27 feet from the, from the road. Thank you. Thank you. Bring it up to public comment. <clears throat> I guess I'd be the only public here, but uh, my name is Dave Allen. I live at Four Beacon Lane. Uh, that's the 18-foot wide end of the <laughs> of Beacon Lane, um, and I've lived there uh, some 30 years. Um, I am familiar with the history of the neighborhood somewhat. Um, and as Steve said, the, the house that uh, was built, that Steve and Ann now occupy, was built in the late 60s, I believe. And the house next to it um, that currently blocks their view of the lighthouse was built after that. It was built in probably 83. 84. It was built just before I built my home in 1984. And then uh, the Lane House across that abuts uh, the actual non working lighthouse was built subsequent to that. <clears throat> so, in my mind, you know, when that house was originally built, there was a view of both lighthouses. Um, and I think that's having the, the great fortune to be able to do that myself, to be able to see two lighthouses, I think is uh, something that they should be given the opportunity to do. Um, the road itself, I mean, it's, it's pretty much been the same. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's a paved cow path. Um, I don't ever see it being anything more than that. In fact, if anything, the neighborhood is trying to figure out ways to have less traffic, given all of the um, people that come by from a tourist perspective and try to view the lighthouses and park in the streets and continue on down through the road. So both road associations are looking for ways to try and further limit access. So I don't ever see kind of that end of the road being widened or anything else being done to it. 
Um, if you look at Steve's property, um, you know, there seems like a very large expanse of lawn currently. Uh, you know, it looks like he's got more lawn between himself and the road now than almost anyone else on the street. Uh, so even though he's asking for a variance, I still think from a site and a visual perspective, it really won't affect the neighborhood. And if anything else, if anything, it'll certainly improve the uh, the value and appearance of his home and the overall appearance of the neighborhood. So I guess as, a, as the member of a neighborhood, um, uh, I would like to ask for your support for their request and uh, I feel confident. I've had a few conversations with neighbors around and even though they're not here tonight, um, I think there is a strong sentiment for allowing Steve and Ann to uh, be able to do this addition if you grant them the variance. Thank you. Any questions from the board? Thank you. Seeing no other members of the public present, we'll close the public discussion period and open it up to uh, board consideration. At this point, I guess we would entertain a, a motion to uh, approve the request or to deny, depending upon the board's wishes. I've got, I've, I've got some discussion, I guess. I, I'd like to, to hear others' name. Yeah. So when I, when I go down and, and uh, look through, if we're talking about Article 5, uh, section 19, 5, 1, B, when we look at the conditions that must exist in order to grant the variance, um, I'll sort of take them off in order, I guess. The need uh, for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not the general condition of the neighborhood. The second one, um, it won't produce a, an undesired change to the character of the neighborhood. It, based on what we've heard, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't sound like it would do that, uh, at least to me. Uh, the, the third one, the practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant and the prior owner. Um, we touched on that a little before, and it sounds like the construction of the house next door that came later is actually causing causing difficulty, so again, in my mind. Well, I, I would say, I, I would argue that, that it's the practical that is a result of the action taken by the prior owner, prior owner by, by building the house, by purchasing that lot, building the house in that location. I mean, they built it as far forward as they pretty, for almost as far forward as they could. They didn't sit it way back, so they put it there. Right, and, and now the difficulty is someone else. Someone else came along. Right. So but in my mind, the difficulty wasn't caused by the prior owner of this lot or the current owner. Uh, that's, that's, that's where I see this one. Uh, no feasible alternative um, to a variance is available. Uh, I, mean, I guess that gets back to the, the question of what's the What's the purpose? Is the purpose to um, increase, you know, build a kitchen? Right. And, and what is the breakfast nook, or is it to, to get views of the lighthouse? It sounds like it's to get views of the lighthouse, and is, is that appropriate? Do we define practical difficulty anywhere? Do we know if anybody can work with the definitions here? If there's practical difficulty? in the application, but page three of the application. No, but what is, okay.
Yeah, essentially, it ties it to significant economic injury, which below is stated as putting the applicant at a disadvantage, uh, comparatively speaking, in the neighborhood. So, you know, it, does it does the situation now prevent the applicant from having a structure or accessory structure comparable in size, location, and number to those of the other lot owners in the immediate neighborhood? Seems like the house is a similar size and similar, similar to the other ones in the neighborhood. Although we have heard testimony that it, it is set farther back than than most of the others, so so you you, it, you could read this in that when compared to the location of other lot owners in the immediate neighborhood, it. It isn't comparable, you know. Yeah. Just touch on the last, um, the last sort of standard. Um, for granting of a, a variance, and it's it will not granting of the variance will not unreasonably adversely affect the natural environment. Again, to me, it doesn't sound like it, no, it would. He's going into a front lawn, which is currently grass, and it sounds like it's flat. So, it doesn't sound like um, an un, an unreasonable uh, adverse effect of the natural environment would take place. So, it sounds to me like we've there there are a couple. <laughs> that we we need to we need to flesh out a little bit. It's a difficult standard. Um, it's an, been adopted by the legislature, obviously, as it indicates the statutory site, and the legislature generally frowns upon on variances. Although I note that you know I think our board has has usually exercised some flexibility with. The, Standard. Seem, seems like a critical question would be, is a view of a lighthouse a significant economic injury? If other neighbors have views of lighthouses and they don't, is that a significant economic injury? Uh, I don't know how many of those other neighbors it, it talks about. 10 of the nearest properties, uh, you know, providing that evidence. I'm not sure we have that specifically here, but we, we do have a little bit of testimony on that. But the home was purchased at a certain price that took into account the use. So there's not really a significant economic injury. I guess the argument is that uh, because the other homes in the neighborhood have less of a setback and therefore better opportunity to have views of the lighthouse that they are more, value, more valuable. Yeah, see, we don't have the column that I asked about uh, before, which would be the front, the, act, the setback to the property line for the homes. I think we did. I think that's uh, not all of them, but it's this. Because in that case, that, that particular column, I guess maybe you've got a marked here two right of way. If, if we're shown that everybody along the street had a 24 foot setback or something's lower than that, and you're at 35 feet 8 inches, then there's an argument to be made that. that that you can be aligned with that. Um, but I don't see that.
Well, given the given the discussion, I don't know if we're at a point where anybody cares to make a motion or continue to to talk about this. Obviously. Ben, I believe that uh, given the fact that we have only four members here tonight, we would need all four to approve the variance if that were to be the way it would go. Is that right? That's correct. Chair, may I make an observation? Please. There's two things that perhaps the applicant may wish to table if it's not too late, this application. Uh, there's three, I'm sorry, I said two. There's three things that, I, that are open questions for me. One is the, what is the property line at the front? Um, and some, yes, we do have a surveyor's map, but I mean, it would be great if we can have the deed and show us that that is the property line, then there would be no issue there. Or if the property line is actually a little closer to the road, then the pressure on us to come up with a solution is less because there's more space on which there's a front lawn and the setback wouldn't be applied. So that's the first part. The second part is um, the, the evidence that may be out there that could assist in the significant value or impact that I think Ben mentioned about it, collecting other evidence from other people in that area. I think the, the statute or well, the ordinance talks about it, um, not more than 10 or whatever that number is. Um, and the third part is that if one of us says no, that's it. So there's not an A, we are fair and impartial, but there's not that um, uh, plurality of views that would balance out the scale. Right now it's either all four or one of us against and then it's not that balanced approach. So I query with those points, unless you have others, whether we should consider, um, in, if the applicant's willing, uh, to table uh, further discussion. Because I'm, I'm troubled with how the ordinance is requiring us to meet certain tests, and um, I'm not feeling uh, in, uh, exuberance to, that we've had the facts to demonstrate that we meet each of the requirements. My last point is I know that uh, the applicant came here this evening, and so it's, it's, um, well, it's almost not wasted time, but there is a consequence of a denial of the variance, and I believe it's a year um, that you can't come back, um, which means that the house will be finished, and then that's, you know, a year from now uh, on this type of application, we'll come back before the same board or different makeup of the board. I think it's a year. Um, uh, so that's, that's uh, uh, I guess, uh, four issues. Yeah. I, I guess I typically trend in favor of trying to move these along and, and um, make a decision. But that being said, any other reactions to the comments? As far as whether we should consider a table. I guess the question really is, is do we see the application as kind of incomplete? It doesn't have information that we would like to see. Um, I think it does, it, I think it is missing. To me, it's missing information that would make me vote in favor of the variance. Now, is the information out there that would change my mind? I'm not sure, but I know that right now I, I'd probably vote against it. I guess, for example, how many other homes have a view of the lighthouse, how many don't? And perhaps photos and the deed. No, for me, it really comes down to the, the, the property line question that I've been harping on, kind of. Okay. Um, and I'd actually like to see more data on, I would like to actually see the deed um, mm -hmm. with the meets and bounds, if, if that's what is on it. Sure. Um, that would actually give us where the property line is, and then some comparative data on what the, where, where, whatever other, other neighbors, um, 
where their buildings are in relation to the, to the property line. Because everyone's been talking about rights of way or the right of way, but to me that's not even, it's not even relevant. I mean, but it's, it's important the developer laid out a, on paper of a wide swath and then they figured out, hey, this is best where to put this skinny little lane. And it doesn't really necessarily have to do with where, where the property lines are. Um, so, my feelings. Well, we're sort of taking a 90-degree uh, turn here, so I feel like if, if we are going to consider this, maybe we should give the, the applicants an opportunity to comment on on what we're talk talking about doing here. If the board is comfortable with that. Yes, I only had one more observation, is that um, if this property does not have a view of the water, then the aesthetic views of the lighthouse may increase the value of, of the home or the property. So the other homes, may have view of the water and the lighthouse, and so there, there is some other aesthetics um, that could impact the, the value of the property. So some people, I, I lived out off Hannaford Cove Road, people come by my property and say, you know, why can I see the lighthouse? You know, they don't want to see the ocean, they want to see the lighthouse. <laughs> so there are people that like watching and looking at lighthouse. Uh, any objection from the board to, to uh, allowing the applicant to, to comment on this? No. Uh, thank you. Answering a question about who has lighthouse and ocean views. All the homes on the east end all have lighthouse and ocean views. Our house on the west would be the only one that currently has some ocean views views of the lighthouse from different parts of the house, but not down in the front because the house is set back. Our house, fortunately and unfortunately, has a third floor. When we first bought the house, when you went up to the third floor, you had a panoramic view of Casco Bay. In the 14 plus years since we've lived there, tree growth is so high, most of that view is now gone. So we rarely go up and use that. So we are the last home on the west end, or the only one on the west end that has any views. The vacant lot, if it was built on next to us, that would not have, uh, would not have views. The house across the street, which is technically part of the east part, uh, they live next to the lighthouse, but I don't think they live next to the non-working lighthouse, but I don't think they have views of the other lighthouse, but they have ocean views out their back way. They live in the back of the house. We live in the front of the house. Um, as far as this uh, property line and the right of way, I've been on the Cumberland County deeds for days trying to figure out. I've gone back and pulled all the plans from Wind Whistle Hill, that's the east. The east end of Beacon Lane is a neighborhood that has ordinances and uh, Beacon Lane West does not. So those houses have rules, they can't have trailers in their yard, they can't rent, a lot of, there's covenants where Beacon Lane West has none of that. We do have a road association, and that was just for the paving of the road and the plowing. So I guess I'm, yeah, I was always confused on, is this where the property ends? And I don't see, after plowing through the websites and the deeds, I don't see any easy answer to finding out if where the pin is, if that's where the right of way is, or if that's where the property line ends. And from listening, it sounds like if you guys were to vote, it doesn't sound like we have a, a good chance just on the, uh, the discussion I'm hearing about our difficulties, practical difficulties. So I, I, it sounds like you're offering the option of us tabling our request, but I don't know what, the, what we would do from there. I think what you would do is uh, 
some members of the, of the board had mentioned the possibility of submitting the deed for your property, which is one thing that we, we don't have here. Um, and maybe offering some additional submissions on some of the other questions that were raised. But if it were tabled, then it would come back, uh, I suspect, at our next meeting, which is in, in October, for full board consideration, where there would be uh, additional members present. Um, what's, what's your construction time frame? You mentioned that the house is still under construction. Well, originally we were just reciting the house and replacing windows, and I have a current building permit to replace the windows on the front, uh, front of the house. We decided maybe we should look at doing an addition before we just put up the windows and reside it, so it kind of stopped. So we've kind of been in limbo for a while, and I really, you know, it, it's not attractive. You know, one part of the house is new shingles, windows, the other part is bare plywood right now, so I really want to move on this. I, you know, I don't like the way it looks. Um, you know, of course, the fall is coming on, and I really wanted to get something, you know, done before uh, winter set in. If I may, Mr. Mosier said that there's a couple of pieces of information that if he had, he could make a more educated vote. So I'm wondering what those, what that item is or those. Well, I think, there, I think the one thing was the deed that would describe where the property line is um, because we just seem to be confused. We don't all know where, where that line is. Um, and that would be the deed itself should have a description of the parcel, hopefully. Um, yes, yeah, it's not real clear. In fact, the town has the lot listed at 1.4 acres. After the uh, survey was done, it came back as 1.363, mm -hmm. and we lost a couple feet on both, both sides. At the back of the property, there's like four abutters, I think. Okay, so the surveyor had access to something that gave, that gave him or her the, the ability to do the, correct, do the survey correctly. The survey. They're, well, I, they're basing it on the monuments that are in the back of the property and they on the side. They also looked at the deed to, say, to look at, to see where the lines should be, and then they would compare, they would, kind of, they would see, what the, see what, the, what the deed says, then go out in the field and actually look to make sure that that is the case. Right, but they're, the, I believe two of the pins were not there. Okay. I think they're... And that, that company that did the survey has done... I think they've done two or three properties on Beacon Lane. Yeah, they referenced some other plans on the survey that that may also, if if they were provided to us, might might give further evidence as to, or at least confirmation that the lot line as shown is in fact the lot line, and that's what we should be applying the setback to. And the other thing would be, um, you're kind of making an economic, an econo one of the pieces of, of the practical difficulty is kind of an economic argument. So we'd want, I'd want to see more data on, on that and how it actually impacts, impacts you in a negative way, the way it is now. I think the hardest thing is going to be proving where the property stops or ends. From remember reading, I don't know if it was a is it ways and means or means, the description? Meets and bounds. Meets, meets and bounds. But it's, it's very confusing. I, I've, I don't know that that's going to help. And I asked, yeah, I asked the surveyor, is there, can we find out where the neighbor's property ends, the, the road and that 10 feet onto our grass? Who owns that? Where does... And they said, you're talking about a lot of, a lot of research, a lot of money to do this. So I thought, okay, we'll start with this. So I guess you're offer, offering me the option of removing our application right tonight and try and provide <clears throat> our deed and more evidence of where the property is. Uh, ends and starts. And 
And Mr. Moser said more evidence of the significant economic injury specifically, which evaluates the 10 nearest properties around you and demonstrates that you're at a disadvantage compared to the 10 nearest properties around you. In a, in a, if, if we were to table it, the next, we would be able to bring it up at the next meeting, which is the end of October? 27th, I think. It's October 27th, and there is r room on that agenda if, if you would like to make that request and if the zoning board grants it. And if we agree, if we don't table it, then you would essentially vote tonight on it? Correct. That would be, have to be unanimous? That's correct. Unanimous to, to approve. Right. Because we're down to four members today. Right. Yeah, Chair, could you explain how many are on the board usually? Yeah, yeah, you guys put me on the spot. What do we have, six or seven members? Seven. We've got seven, seven members. And you need a majority of, of the membership um, to approve. Um, so we need the full four in order to approve tonight. Hard, hard to say how that consideration will come out. I, I know that the board does reserve the, the authority, whether you consent or not, but obviously right. we do want your input. Um, we could still table the matter, um, but certainly want to, to get your input on that. Right. But looking at the ordinance, I was, I, when I talked to Ben, I thought that that line was, when he looked at the survey, that that was the right of way and that's where the measurement was coming from. What is, if that's where they say the line is, how would me being able to show, if that's where the survey <coughs> say the property ends, what would a deed or any other proof, how is it going to help me? Well, I guess if we're going, I guess, uh, I guess it look this way. If, if we go from the, the cert, what the surveyor has here, then he's look, we're looking at a significant encro encroachment on the setback. Right. And so your, another document might set a line in different, might, might make it less of an encroachment in the setback. It, it, it might, but I don't know. It, it might not. Yes. But, but we don't have it as part of the record here to actually be able to look at it is, right. is the point. Nor do I, or I would have okay. submitted sure. that. Now, the other thing, the economic and the practical difficulties, if are those, I mean, I have nothing else but to say that we want to have a view of the lighthouse and we can't see it because of the other house blocking. So I don't know what other thing I'm going to be able to add to that to make that, you know, look better for me. So if, even if I was able to produce a document showing I had a better property line, are the other things going to already negate that and I won't get it approved anyway? That's a, a, an open question. Yeah, I mean, we, don't know. <laughs> we can't sit here. It, it, what I'm hearing is right. we can't sit here right right, right, right. now and 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 tell I you how. Try, to, yeah, it's worth the try. It's worth, worth the, the try. try. But also, it's a different makeup. It's the next the next right. board meeting. Theoretically, we don't know that, but it right. could be a different makeup. So, and and I'll I'll add that the practical difficulty standard, which is defined on page three of the application. Um, pretty specifically talks about um, uh, the, your lot being at a disadvantage in the neighborhood when compared to um, lot owners in the immediate neighborhood, but in no case fewer than 10 of the nearest property owners. And I think what, what I've heard tonight is, and, and I, I sort of agree, I, I don't think we've heard enough Comparison. I mean, we may be able to make, um, we may be able to find that indeed there is a practical difficulty and you may be, um, it may be resulting in significant economic injury, 
but uh, again, I don't think we have, I don't think you, you've gone far enough in comparing your lot and, your, and, the, and the, the location of your house to no fewer than the 10 nearest to butters. And probably what would be helpful there would be some actual photos of, of neighboring properties, the homes. Unless they're so they're lo looking for a decision, do we want a table or do we want? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you for giving us that option. I really appreciate it. So, unless there are any other um, questions for the applicants, uh, I think Matthew, it's your motion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can make it if you like. <laughs> Go ahead. I move to table this discussion to the October 27th meeting. I second that motion. Sure. Second. Any discussion on the motion? Not on the motion, but on. We can tell the applicant afterwards, but um, there is no guarantees here. Sure. Right. Okay. Good point. Uh, hearing no discussion, we vote on the motion. All in favor of the motion to table this matter to the October 27th meeting. Opposed? Motion carries. Let's this on October 27th. <laughs> Moving on through the agenda, we don't have. Uh, Really much more to talk about, except uh, Joanna Terenjo has uh, resigned. She's moved out of town. So congratulations to Joanna. And uh, I guess the town will be considering a new appointee in the coming weeks. Any other communications from the board? I'd like to entertain a motion to adjourn. I make that motion. <laughs> <I'll> second it. <laughs> All in favor. Great. Thanks, guys. <laughs>